afternoon. I kind of lost my voice a little bit. I think, uh, I don't know if it's the wine or it's because I talk too much. I think throughout the conversations we've had over the last three days, they've been really stimulating on four different venues. There is no question from day one, His Excellency Bruno Jean Richard Etour called on us to have an energy initiative or a green dialogue and wants to see us really drive that as something for next year. I think we listen carefully to what His Excellency advised and called on us to do. And I think one of the true meanings of what we do, it's about picking great ideas and picking great things and driving action to it because there's nothing so powerful than having a, a great, a, an idea that sticks with you, then you put action to it, means that great idea's time has come. From the chamber, we've had our very good friend, Abdul, really driven us. I'm not a green guy, okay, let's keep, take that very clear. But really driven us on this um, green stuff. Um, Chancellor Merkel's Minister for Africa has had conversations with us. Congressman Scott Taylor, same thing. His Excellency Gabriel Obiang Lima, same thing. So it's very difficult for my tongue to talk about green. So I'd rather bring His Excellency Minister Itour to start the dialogue, and it will be a very quick dialogue. Hopefully we'll have a green We'll start a green dialogue all over next year, and next year during Africa Energy Week, we would even have a green energy summit during the week. So His Excellency Minister Itua, please come up. I also invite His Excellency Minister Gabriel. I would invite uh, Congressman Scott Taylor. And uh, I also think we should have the Secretary General of the African Petroleum Producers Organization, Dr. Farouk, I'll put him on the spot, and also Madam Minister, um, High Excellency um, Sophie Gladima from uh, um, Senegal, and the German guy ran away. I think he's still trying to find his way here, but we'll let the Minister um, they, should, they, would, they would start that dialogue. It's going to be brief, but maybe five to ten minutes once they have that dialogue. We would let our friends in the media ask them any questions. There are no proposals. It's just a pledge to start a green dialogue around Africa and hopefully we'll have a green initiative that comes. I see Nook at a German. Bring him here. Get him. Grab him. You know, if you don't come here, I tell Merkel they'll fire you, or some of these journalists will write bad stories about you. They'll say you came to Africa, drank wine. Julius, Ruf Madi, Nuka, that is come, grab my open. Good. They always say Germans come on time. This one is late. It's been in Africa too much. <laughs> Mr. Nuka, please come. You've spent too much time in Africa, and now you know how to come late. Yeah? <laughs> Find a way to stick the knife on you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a bad tongue. I say things that uh, some uh, always tell me. But I'll pass it to His Excellency Bruno Jean Jacques, um, Jean Richard. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thank you, Ayuk. Once again, you're showing us. Uh, that uh, you know how to go very quickly when um, a good idea is on the table, as you you did for this uh, very good gathering, which you have organized in a, in a very short time. Uh, I think you, you have uh, really captured the ideas. 
from myself, but also from many other people. Uh, even uh, they didn't say it in the same way. I think it's uh, the same idea we all have. We want to show that Africa is not a problem regarding the climate change issue. We want to show that maybe it's one of the best solution for the world regarding this uh, um, issue and discussion and topics people are talking uh, all the time and uh, without uh, really giving a, a right solution, a, a, a practical solution, or operational solution. We want to show that we in Africa, we didn't wait for all those meetings to work on that. When we're battling to keep forest, when we're battling to keep the very rich biodiversity we have in our country, when we do it by ourselves, without any help, any support, any financial support. We, all the time, having speeches and speeches, we have commitment, we hear about this $100 million which should be given to Africa in order to save and preserve what we have in our continent, not for us, but for all of the world. When we're working to remain producing oil and gas in the best way we can do it, investing money to, to, to have access to the best technologies, attracting the best companies. When we, we make good choices like uh, now putting gas as one of the main objectives of our oil and gas industry, when organizing this kind of gathering, when trying to promote renewable energies, when no, no one was talking about that. No one was talking about that. We, we should take the leadership about green initiative in the world by having one. That's the idea. How we do it, uh, we will be involved and committed. I think uh, uh, I, I, you uh, has given, uh, I think, the, the guidelines. We should involve all the shareholders, stakeholders of, uh, of, uh, of what we're doing, which means private sector, public sectors, civil, civil society, and so, and so, and so. And we will be driving that. Why not the chamber? Why not the chamber? So all those, I mean, issues should be discussed during one year by a dialogue. We can launch now. And in one year, we come back here with something on the table. That's the idea. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. <laughs> I would like to move to your extreme end, but I cannot. I will start with uh, His Excellency Gunter Nuke and have a few comments from him, then Madame Sophie Klaguna. But I know the Germans like women, first lady. Could I have uh, Her Excellency Sophie Gladima to do it. You came late anyway, Nuka. So why don't we have Madame Sophie Gladima, then Mr. Nuka. Madame Sepuvumena. Okay, you. <laughs> See, it's, it's difficult for the old white man here. <laughs> You're not the only white man here. We've got someone <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> thank you, uh, André, and thank you for this kindness. Uh, I, I'm here to understand uh, what is really going on in Africa and to understand all the people have contributed to this uh, Africa Energy Week. But I have also said there is a need to speak about green energy. And uh, in my opening remarks, I mentioned I'm the green sheep of the flock, but maybe uh, there are much more, or many more, uh, those thinking about uh, what I have heard from Africans. If Arab countries delivered oil for the world and Russia the gas, Africa should deliver green energy, renewable energies, not only for Africa, but for the entire world. And that means sun, 
wind, and also hydro. And I, I think there is a huge potential we have to unlock, and I can promise uh, if there is an adequate framework and there is a need and a request which will come from Africa, Germany and European Union cannot deny this. Because of, I'm very convinced, what I have learned in my last 11, 12 years as a special envoy of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, when I'm traveling around on the African continent, we, we are all together forced to work with each other. I'm using the term of companions on a rocky road, maybe, but, but we, we have to learn together, maybe we have to fail together and to go back and try again. But the European Union and the European countries, we are interested in the well-being of Africa. We need a start of a huge industrialization of the continent, and that will start with energy, and it will be more successful if it will start from the beginning also with green energy. And that's why, why I mentioned in my opening remarks, why not speak about Inga, Inga 3 at least, or Grand Inga. It's a huge potential. You can use it for green hydrogen production to make the project bankable, what is difficult, what, what other mentions without a, a grid, which is very expensive and not everywhere the best way to solve the problems of villages in Africa, but you can use this to produce hydrogen for Europe, for others, to, to sell this and to uh, yeah, get revenue for the African budget or for the budget of the DRC, and then uh, it could be used for this kind of, yeah, I mentioned uh, Chen Chen of Africa. That was what the Chinese did from Hong Kong uh, they created uh, a special economic zone in Shenzhen in, 18, uh, in, in 1987, and that was uh, the starting point of the industrialization of the mainland of China. And I think it's not a time to make little plans. It's much more time to think big, and that is what maybe also many people in Europe have to learn. Uh, I'm speaking also to my domestic audience. They speak a lot about partnership with Africa, but if it comes to concrete projects, many people and also companies, politicians, diplomats, uh, entrepreneurs, they hesitate to do anything. And we have to learn that that will let us in a big, big crisis. And what we can do is to learn from each other, to put on the table what we can contribute. We are different, the challenges are different in Europe and in, in Africa. But what we can do and what we have to do is we will survive together and then we will win together. I will avoid, and that's the last sentence, to put it really in a big picture, I will avoid and Europe's, European people were, were responsible for that in the past. I will avoid that Africa is becoming a, a better ground for the new world order, order between China and US. Europe has to play its own role, and Africa has the chance to do it with us and to say what they expect, what we have to do, that this endeavor will be successful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Madame Her Excellency Sophie Gladimo. Merci, Angie. Uh, je vais commencer par uh, la fin de la proposition de notre collègue. Effectivement, il faut qu'on se donne la main. Aujourd'hui, l'impact de ces changements climatiques touche tout le monde. L'Afrique n'a contribué que pour 1% dans la majorité et 3% pour 4 pays. Et quand on voit en Europe la contribution à ce changement climatique de 
quand vous ramenez à 50%, ce serait difficile que l'Afrique puisse se relever avec ça. C'est vrai, on parle d'énergie verte, on parle d'énergie propre, mais à l'heure actuelle, la technologie ne marche pas encore avec ces énergies propres. Donc il faut du temps pour que ces technologies s'adaptent. Et il faut également des moyens, parce que ce n'est pas aussi, euh, comme on dit, c'est assez cher encore pour le moment. Donc là, il faudra marcher avec les deux pieds. Marcher avec les deux pieds, c'est continuer à utiliser ces énergies fossiles, mais également se mettre en même temps avec les énergies renouvelables. Donc faire ce mix énergétique. Mais des infrastructures aussi, il faudrait les en avoir. Et je suis tout à fait d'accord avec lui. Aujourd'hui, il faut que l'Afrique parle d'une seule voix. Et je pense que là, l'Union africaine a un rôle important à jouer. L'année prochaine, je pense que nous aurons le président du Sénégal qui sera la tête de l'Union africaine. Il est plus que temps et opportun que les Africains se donnent la main et travaillent ensemble. Nous avons aujourd'hui l'exemple de l'APO. Je pense qu'il reviendra là-dessus. Il y a le problème de financement. Pourquoi nous devons toujours aller chercher les financements à l'extérieur Pourquoi ne pas, déjà en interne en Afrique, comme il le propose avec l'AFC, ce bras séculier de l'APO pour avoir des financements, aider les autres pays africains aujourd'hui à pouvoir pas se développer seul, mais en partenariat, en apportant quelque chose parce que c'est comme dans un mariage, chacun apporte quelque chose. Si aujourd'hui, en tant que pays africain, avec des institutions comme l'AFC, nous apportons quelque chose avec d'autres partenaires qui viennent, je pense qu'ensemble, effectivement, on se considérerait comme des compagnons, mais pas tout le temps comme des assistés. Autre chose également, c'est euh, que la voix de l'Afrique aussi soit entendue. On va aujourd'hui aux Nations Unies, Écoute, l'Afrique n'a pas de voix là-bas. Il est plus que temps que l'Afrique ait une voix au niveau de ses instances de décision à travers le monde. Le reste des ressources naturelles, on n'en trouve qu'en Afrique pratiquement. Bon, il y en a ailleurs. Des gens ont, des, certains pays ont préféré garder ces ressources pour les générations futures. Garder aussi bien des ressources fossiles comme des ressources naturelles, comme les forêts, on les garde pour les générations futures et on vient exploiter les ressources en Afrique. Mais on ne les transforme pas en Afrique. Et ça aussi, c'est une grosse perte pour l'Afrique. Les ressources sont prises, exportées à l'extérieur, transformées là-bas pour les faire revenir en Afrique parce que tout simplement, le coût de l'électricité est très élevé. Donc, on n'est pas compétitif à ce niveau-là. Et c'est là où aujourd'hui, on a donné l'exemple du Congo, où on disait que le Congo devrait pouvoir peut-être permettre l'électrification de toute l'Afrique si on utilisait le fleuve Congo. Mais ça prendrait combien de temps pour construire toutes ces infrastructures Ça ne se fait pas en une année, deux ans. Et ça va prendre au moins une bonne vingtaine d'années, une bonne trentaine d'années. Parce que quand même, on va traverser des zones sensibles. Là également, les gens vont s'élever pour dire qu'on ne touche pas à nos forêts. Les environnementalistes vont dire qu'on ne touche pas à nos forêts. Les routes, ce serait la même chose. Donc, ça ne peut pas se faire dans un délai très court. Et donc, pendant ce temps, est-ce qu'on doit arrêter le développement de l'Afrique Non, il faudrait qu'on exploite. Il faut qu'on continue d'exploiter et qu'ensemble, nous puissions trouver des moyens de dépolluer l'utilisation de ces énergies fossiles. Parce que si les gens se donnent les moyens, on peut le trouver. Donc, les utiliser en parallèle qu'avec les énergies propres, telles que le gaz tel que l'hydrogène, mais tel que le solaire et l'hydraulique ou bien l'éolien. Prendre en compte également les différences sociologiques. Ces différences, il en a parlé. Ces différences sociologiques sont importantes parce que les communautés ne réagissent pas de la même manière. Les réalités socioculturelles, les réalités socio-religieuses ne sont pas les mêmes. Donc, il y a un frein. On ne peut pas venir aujourd'hui imposer des choses nous devons y aller doucement. Et donc, c'est ça l'inclusion. Parce que si nous faisons cette transition énergétique sans qu'il y ait cette inclusion, on risque de déstabiliser encore le système qui va créer encore d'autres perturbations. Arriver à ce que euh, le coût puisse être le, plus, le moins cher possible. 
Aujourd'hui, on dit oui, n'utilisons plus le charbon. Mais avec le charbon, vraiment, le coût de l'électricité aurait pu permettre et devrait permettre à, ces, à nos pays de se développer. Et nous sommes solidaires avec ces pays qui utilisent ce charbon. Nous ne disons pas qu'ils ne doivent, qu doivent pas arrêter. Si, ils doivent arrêter. Mais qu'on leur laisse le temps, aujourd'hui, de pouvoir arrêter et de se mettre à 90% ou bien à 75% avec le mix énergie, aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, moi, je pense que c'est ensemble, effectivement, que nous pouvons sauver la planète, mais c'est ensemble également que nous devons faire cette transition énergétique qui puisse permettre à tous les pays d'être au même niveau pour que le, la stabilité continue de régner à travers le monde. Parce que tant que ces pays ne seront, seront instables, la paix ne s'installera pas dans le monde. Donc, trouvons les solutions ensemble, parlons ensemble, mais également que l'Afrique aussi se donne les moyens de pouvoir être avec les autres. Voilà, Engie, vous félicitez encore pour la tenue de cette rencontre qui nous permet de lancer les bases d'une discussion autour de cette problématique où tout le monde réfléchit depuis et que l'Afrique n'a toujours pas encore engagé dans, au niveau des instances les plus importantes de l'Afrique, au niveau Union africaine, parce que aussi là, il y a le, le, la, le, le, la réglementation qu'il faudra harmoniser, qu'on se donne ensemble le temps d'harmoniser nos lois, nos pratiques et également le type de financement dont nous avons besoin. Voilà ce que je voulais dire en introduction. Thank, thank you so much. I will bring, I will now ask uh, His Excellency Gabriel um, Bagobiang Lima for his remarks. Thank you very much, uh, NJ. And I want to first of all start uh, like I did in the opening. Uh, congratulate you, you, NJ, and all the team. Uh, I mean, they have been chasing us with cameras everywhere, taking pictures, <laughs> and the rest of them moving back and forth. The guys in the chamber, uh, because uh, we do, I do have to say one thing I'm extremely happy to be here because I got tired of just participating in, in conferences that are video conference. Um, you are just sitting there and just watching people on the screen. It gets very boring. <laughs> and being able to, after two years being a conference, talking people face to face, there is nothing better than, than this. And, and this is why, uh, this, is, this is my, my fear, this is what I like to do. Uh, and again, it's something that uh, I'm extremely happy for that. Um, clearly, my comments are going to be very similar than what I did at the opening. It, it was the question that we asked, why we are here? Uh, and I have to say, we were saying we are here for Africa. We are here for our people, for our country, for the human resources, that, uh, the, the mineral resources that God has given us. We also are here for Cape Town. We have contributed in a way indirectly to the economy drinking wine, cheese, you know, hotels. So I think they should be happy about that seeing petroleum guys going around. We always spend dollars everywhere. And, 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 and clearly, because of the voice. I mean, I have to say one thing. Um, the bees go where the, the, the honey is. So when you have people even protesting, it's a good sign. <laughs> it's a sign that this is very important. Important people are here because if we were not important, they will never come. They will just, ah, those guys are nothing. But if they are coming and they are protesting the second day, I was happy <laughs> because I knew that they were listening to us. They knew that we were important. So that's a good sign. It's not a bad sign. So people should not worry about when people go protesting because it means that we are important and that we make decisions. But, but clearly it's because we, we need to make a decision. And, and I said when I was talking um, uh, in one of the forums about our priorities, What's the priority of Africa? And I said, because I, I don't want to criticize nobody, no continent, but if, 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 if you get anybody and they stay two weeks without electricity, two weeks having to go walking from your house to your work or your children having to walk to the street, your priority change. You say, I don't care about those smoke. I don't care about, no, what I want is I want this priority to be fixed. So, and, and I want to end with this because it's not because I'm pro-America, Russian, and Chinese. These are superpowers. And I like it for one thing. They are pragmatic. They put the priority first. One, they solve the priority, and then they talk about something else. So what we have to do is decide what's the priority for Africa. 
if they help us to satisfy our priority, build a road for us, the hospitals, do all the electricity, bring us all the university, solve for the problem, then we'll listen to you. But in the meantime that our priority are not fixed, we're gonna have to find a way. And hydrocarbons and fusion fuels is what will solve it. We are here in South Africa and Cape Town, they're having blackouts back and forth. What's the solution? It's gas, LNG. It's no power, it's, if you need to build a, a nuclear plant, you'll be like 10 years to do it. If you need to do hydro, you have to wait for all the university to get the best technology. The solution is simple. You do a, a, a gas terminal, a receiving terminal, like the Europeans have in Germany, in Spain, in Portugal. You build it, in six months you can build with floating LNG, you put it here in Cape Town, you have gas in Equator LNG in Equatorial Guinea, in Qatar, in less than one year, the power problem is fixed. It's gas, it's pragmatic. So China needed to develop their country and their people, and they use coal. Once they finish all the development, they say, okay, now I can change. So it's the same thing with us. And, and people don't want to understand it, that's fine, but for me, my priority is that my country can have the road electricity, my people can develop, and then once I have the infrastructure, then I can have my electric cars who can plug it there, in the meantime, I'm still going with my Mercedes, BMW, the rest, my trucks, to be able to do all my work. So again, it's an issue about priority. It's not an issue about philosophy, <laughs> okay? With that, I want to thank you. Okay. Congressman Taylor. <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to stand up. For, first, can we give a round of applause for NJ and his awesome team for putting this together. It's amazing, <laughs> amazing. It's a huge honor for me to be here in Africa with greetings from the United States. I also wanna tell any media that's out there, let the record state that NJ called for the first Green Africa Summit every year. Absolutely, right? It's coming. So the non-green guy is gonna become green, right? It's coming. Uh, look, I, I also, let, let's say this. There is an African proverb that says the chameleon changes to resemble the world. The world doesn't change to resemble the chameleon, right? The reality is the world is moving in that direction. It's moving in the green direction, right? However, there's another African proverb that we must heed, that Africa must heed, and that is don't be frightened by the roaring lion into the territory of the crouching lion. And what that means, of course, is don't listen to all that noise out there that may make you go into a position that's a lot more dangerous. There's over 600 million people in Africa with energy poverty, period. The circumstances here in this continent are different than other ones. There has to be a solution that is fair, that is just, and that lets those folks, those children, be as productive as they could be in life, and they will need energy to do that. Now, I come to you from the United States, work in government relations, private diplomacy, and business development. I will tell you there are tons of American companies who are willing and able to come to Africa to help out, whether that's in energy, whether that's in green, or a combination of the two, which will probably have to happen. But the reality is, as the good minister said, the priorities of Africa have to be Africa-centric, period. You have to come together in unity, stand up with a strong spine, and tell the world, we're gonna deal with those 600 million people with energy poverty. We're going, we have these God-given resources that we're going to use to help with our development. We're gonna be partners in the world with the Europeans, with the Americans, we're gonna be partners we're gonna to work together to have a greener future because in, indeed we are our brothers and sisters of this world, right? But there's no question that Africa has to stand up for Africa and put Africa's priorities first and tell that to the world, right? Indeed. It's an honor to be here with you. I'm thankful for, for NJ for bringing me here. I'm looking forward to helping in any capacity that we can, of course. And I do think, as the gentleman from Germany said, Africa needs to think big. You need to think real big. This is not the time for small thinking now that you're not Zooming anymore and you're traveling, <laughs> right? God bless you all. God bless Africa. And I look forward to being part of the solution. Thank you.
Africa loves your proverbs. <laughs> His Excellency, my brother, Farouk Ibrahim, the Secretary General of Apple. Thank you very much, Ayuk. I should, uh, I guess I want to do what you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have uh, three, four of my ministers here, two on the high table and two down there, and a potential uh, minister of Apple also to my left. And that makes it uh, fairly difficult for me uh, to make uh, statements uh, that haven't been cleared. And uh, it's also difficult to give an opinion because <laughs> your opinion may translate into... But having said that, I, I want to say that seriously, um, Africa believes that we have a responsibility to ourselves and to our people to give them the energy they need to get out of the current energy poverty. From Tuesday to date, we've been hearing about you need help, you need help, you need help. Our mentality has been wired to believe that we can't make progress without help. Um, Again, I, uh, as I talk, I have to be extra careful. I have <laughs> my ministers here. But seriously speaking, we cannot continue to rely or depend on help from outside. We've got to begin to think seriously. <laughs> Yesterday, I mentioned that when we say we don't have capital in Africa, we are looking outside for capital. I don't believe this is correct. And I gave two examples. Between 2003 and 2008, oil producing African countries made hundreds of billions in wind, uh, dollars energy, uh, oil windfall. This year, our countries budgeted maximum, maximum $45 per barrel. I stand to be corrected. Today, oil price is over $80 per barrel. What are we doing when we say we don't have money? Every single cent we get, we are interested in consuming it. <laughs> and when you consume, unfortunately in Africa, that consumption doesn't go down to the masses. It's the elites. It's our lifestyle that is holding us backwards. The Excellencies Ministers commissioned asked us to do a study on the future of the oil and gas industry in Africa in the light of COVID and the energy transition. I am not in a position to give you the highlights of our findings because it has not gone to them. But with your kind permission, I want to say that we are looking beyond just oil and gas. What you just said, Ayuk, we are open to every sort of energy that will help us transform our people, our economies, for the better. We have the population to be able to make, uh, to create demand. We have 1.3 billion people in Africa, the vast majority of whom do not have access to energy. All you need to do is give them that opportunity to become able to buy um, energy. And all that we produce, 8 million barrels of oil a, a day in Africa, will not be enough for them. Whether you like it or not, in the next few years, you will not get a market for your oil. Whether you like it or not, we have 125 billion barrels of oil in our ground. For over 100 years, Europe and America had known about climate change. 
not in the world climate change, but they had known about GHG. Nobody did anything about it because they wanted to develop their economies. They wanted to develop their people. They wanted to give their people good health, education, and everything. The first study that talked about climate change was before the uh, 1896 or so, yes, and subsequent ones in the 1920s, but they carefully buried it away from us. Now that the European economy, American economy does not depend on mass energy production, they are telling us you don't need it. It is harmful to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we also realize the difficulties we face. We can't go alone, we can't go it alone. We are open to discussion. Ayuk, Apo, would uh, my dear ministers please allow me to say this. <laughs> Apo will be with you when we come to discuss the green, I wouldn't say green initiative, let's say green Africa. We are open to discuss everything because not all African countries have oil. Some have advantages in the green uh, energy sector and we want to carry everybody along. We have to first of all change our mentality. We have to look within and the first way to do this is for our elites to learn to moderate their consumption. That money can go into the development of Africa. Thank you very much. Well, I think I remember two years ago, Minister Gabriel Obian created some scandal here where he said women are responsible for climate change. <laughs> and I will give him a chance to put that in context. But also, Minister Itua, having listened to everybody, you have a big job to do. Don't put this in the chamber. You know, with your skillful diplomacy and that of Nuka, I would only hope you can moderate the, the Yankee, bring our lady minister together, get the schnitzel eating German to come on time and continue to make sense, and get Minister Obiang to not say women cause more climate change because they buy nice fancy bags, they want all the beautiful things, so, and all the shopping, so we have to produce more. So, and definitely for my brother, my big brother, my friend, my teacher, Farouk Ibrahim, I think this would be one of the best dialogues that we'll have around Africa. And I think it is a chance for all of, all of us, everybody, to be part of this, to really drive it. And I just want to thank Abdul for really pushing us to do this. It's a former Schlumberger guy who, I don't know what they gave him, he thinks green now. And I don't want to be part of his dialogue because I don't believe in this. But uh, I'm, I, I'm honest, I don't believe in this green stuff. But they, they would have to draw me into the room. So I'll give you guys in the media um, a chance to ask a few questions. I know you, some of you would say, NJ doesn't believe in green. It's true, I don't. But uh, you could ask them, it's not about me, it's about them. So they all believe in it. So you could ask your questions and we would have them answer to the best of their abilities before they can leave. So we could have two or three media questions. But this is the launching of the African Green Dialogue, which at the next year, African Energy Week, we would be able to have some very special things that they would lead us to. So media, if you have any questions to them, please do it now or shut up. <laughs> I'm the only guy that can tell the media to shut up, okay? I mean, come on, let's be honest. I'm a creation of the media. You made me. 
So now I could give it back to you, all right? So who, if, who from the media, one of you guys in the back, ask your questions. Where are they? For the first time, the media has no questions to the big There's people. One, uh, NJ. So they all agree with, with what you said. There's one, NJ, um, it's right over here. Please can we keep the question short? Thank you so much. This is not media. And you call Dr. Dieng media. That's right, I'm not media. But uh, I really appreciate what have been said here that Africa itself can finance its own development. The gentleman, Mr. Minister, talk about the lifestyle of the elite, but also the mentality of the regular people always trying to imitate, trying to not have nice things. Is Africa willing to take the dormant money back into public treasuries, former presidents, former ministers, former directors who have billions. I'm talking about African money. That's not be put into a business. Is the African state ready to go back to those people, take that money back into public treasury? We have to do that. Because even the poorest Okay, people, Dr. Dieng, I'm going to have to stop. No, oh, okay. I'm paying for this, Mike. You stop. That, no, 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 take the mic away. Uh, let me congratulate you for your success. Okay, now you state. can talk, but they give, give me the mic back. That is not green initiative. You right. and Adam and um, can have that discussion. There's one question somewhere. for Media House. You think? Get me the media. It's fine, there's one question. When I'm moderate, I don't, I don't like nonsense. I, I want real questions. Uh, good afternoon. I I'm, would like you to tell me your media organization. Yeah, I'm from the Namibian uh, Broadcasting Corporation. Oh, I love you guys. Yeah. I like my <laughs> Tura boys, so go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, um, Namibia is set to uh, for a $9 billion green hydrogen uh, development. Um, I, I'd just like to know from the, uh, from the panel what are their views on this and how, it, how they see this development going forward. Thank you. That was not about a green initiative, but okay, I'll let them say one or two comments and we'll close it. Adama guy is very happy because I gave you Dr. Dieng to go talk to her. That's exactly what you need someone mentioned in your name, and I'll do it. So please go ahead. You see, you see they're all ministers like green hydrogen, like this is so hard for them, eh? <laughs> go ahead. I don't, I don't know really what Namibia is doing very well, but I would like maybe to add some, some, some more comments. And if we agree that maybe we should go what we want to do, not uh, initiative, because we're doing already so much before today. So maybe we should say African Green Dialogue. Um, I think somebody was talking about African Union. Uh, I think it was my, my, my dear colleague and sister from Senegal. African Union tried to have a one voice message. The responsibility was given to the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Melese, Melese Lawi, that was her name. And after him, it was given to my president, President Chasun Ngeso. And then time to time, we have other presidents, head of state, doing the same thing on behalf of Africa, trying to explain to the rest of the world what is African position. I don't think that it will be very efficient. I don't think so. Even now in Glasgow, Africa is trying to say what, what we think about that issues of climate change and advocating to have the support of who, who are responsible of the situation. But I don't think that it's very efficient. So the idea is maybe we should try by another side to support what African Union, our head of state, they're trying to do. We should try by another side and this side could be this one. What is it here? We have government, we ministers, 
We have private companies, international ones, local ones. We have civil society. We have medias. And we have a young man. He will become green. <laughs> a young man, very dynamic and uh, able to bring all of us here in uh, Cape Town in a short time and uh, try to talk about this very difficult issue of should we remain producing oil and gas in Africa or no? And we, we're doing that. So I'm sure he's able to, deep, to do more. Maybe to bring, to strengthen the voice of Africa lead by not only the head of state of African Union and so on, so because uh, until now is not very efficient, but by all the stakeholders who are represented here by all of us. That's an idea, idea, idea. When we say green, for me, there is no opposition between um, renewable energy and oil and gas. No, no more. Oil and gas, I think we tried to explain that during all the days. I, I hope we have been very efficient for that, clever and efficient. Oil and gas can be produced in a clean way, in a green way. That's what we're saying. The solution is not one kind of energy is green and clean and, and nice and good. Another one is black, is bad. No. All of us African producing countries, oil companies, we working to be part of the solution to reduce the impact of climate change and we showing that all the day, all the time. We didn't wait for today, we didn't wait for Glasgow to do that, no. No. When you talk about carbon sequestration, when you talk about uh, biofuels, when you talk about uh, gas today, you already started showing, doing oil industry in the right direction. So the idea is not to start now, to discover how to do it. We know how to do it. The idea is to have a dialogue and bring on the table of the worldwide discussion one African solution because we think that Africa has all the components of the solution. We have the forest, we have water, we have wind, we have sun, we, we have hydropower potential, the biggest, maybe one of the biggest in the world. And we have oil and gas. So maybe we are the best continent to propose, to make a proposal on the best mix, the best energy mix. It doesn't mean that we stop developing our countries. No. We want to do it maybe in a better way than the ones we did it in the past and bring the world to be in that situation. That's what he's saying. We must show to the world how they should do before to avoid being like we are here, we are today. And we can do it. The technology is there. Young people are there. Very clever. The continent has a huge need of energy, of developing countries. So it's the right place to showcase the best example of, of what should have been done in the past. That's the idea. So let us talk about that. Thank you. Minister Gabriel Obiang, um, then we'll end with Nuka. His Excellency Bruno just called me young again, so <laughs> I'm feeling very good. Um, the question of the, the, the journalist, the press from Namibia, um, the answer is very simple. I have no idea. I mentioned it yesterday that we have not been trained for that technology. If you ask me if Namibia is doing a gas to power, if you ask me Namibia is doing an FPSO, I'll give you right now the answer and I'll tell you if it is a good or no. But when you ask me a technology that I have never 
None of my staff, none of my country have gone to university knowing about it. I cannot answer if it is good or bad. The only thing that I can tell you, and this is what I have to deal every day in Equatorial Guinea, is that there is a lady in the market. She's selling vegetable, fruits, and fish. The only one, the only thing she wants is electricity. If the project in Namibia is going to provide electricity to that lady, it's a good project. That's my answer. Thank you. Excellency Nuka. Yes, thank you for uh, having the, the micro here. The German government, I should say this uh, as an official representative of the German government, that the Federal Ministry for Education and Research in Germany gave money to the Namibians uh, for this development uh, and yeah, look which kind of hydrogen, hydrogen production will be possible. And uh, that is maybe a trigger. But I count on the private sector. I mentioned it's not about little plants. We have to be, uh, think big. And that means if there is not a framework uh, the legal framework, the security, the, the guarantee of investments, pre pre <coughs> predictability and accountability for the investments, then the private sector, at least from Europe, will uh, hesitate to come. That's, uh, that's one issue. And I, I fully agree, agree with what have said here, with the money in Africa, it could be used for the electricity of the lady on the market. Of course. And uh, I, am, I, I will be happy if donor money, development aid will not necessary to combat extreme poverty. But we have also this on the continent. And I think that is also part of a green dialogue and an honest exchange also with German taxpayers and others. The German uh, energy policy is, is not uh, very rational in, in, in some uh, sentence or in, in, in certain con concern. So we, uh, we have to speak about that. And we, we can do things together. And I think also using money from oil and gas for development, for this kind of industrialization, as I, I have mentioned. And if you ask uh, about the technologies, the German company Linde has been here in South Africa over more than 100 years. The, the technology, the, the, the chemical uh, technology behind that is, is known. We, we can do it. It's a, it's a question of the cost. And it's a question of which kind of demand in the world will be uh, in United States, in China, uh, especially in Europe, if we are believe in our own window dressing or have the right uh, counting about that. So we, we are also forced to to be aware of what we are doing and what we are yeah, uh, telling our African partners. I'm not here to lecture, to lecture everyone or to, to lecture an, uh, anyone. I'm, I'm here to more, more or less only in a listening mode to understand better which kind of projects or programs we should do together. And that means, of course, with the money of those who are relatively rich because of uh, the gas and oil uh, business. And in the end, it's the decision of the Africans itself. And the voice from Africa is important. Europeans can do nothing, but Europeans can answer if there is a request and there is an interest in technology. There is an interest maybe also in collecting money to invest. And what I have said is, uh, coming back to the Namibian issue, it is not about uh, pro producing hydrogen, it's about the framework. And I think what I mentioned, special economic zones, sustainable economic zones, maybe new cities will be necessary to attract the African, but also international private capital to invest. But that is possible, and that is my belief that this kind of African Green Dialogue is necessary and it is coming uh, to the right time here. Thank you very much and sorry for that 
I have to go <laughs> for my flight to Joburg. You, you show up late now, you've got to leave early. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think everyone would agree that it would be a real dialogue, as we have heard from the ministers and the distinguished um, members here. I would encourage everyone to engage with them. We will put out more information. We would have Adama Gaye asking all the questions he wants. We will have Dr. Dieng bringing his opinions. But there are many shades of green, and we'll make sure that the voices and all collective voices come in so that we can really, really drive something better. But next year, we'll have a Green Energy Summit as part of Africa Energy Week. Your Excellencies, I want to thank you for taking this time spontaneously, and so thank you so much. And with Yolisa, who wants to continue her panel, so if any of you has to stay on, on, on stage, then you might have to keep talking, but I don't know. I just want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank um, Energy Capital and Power for doing such an amazing job. I want to thank the minister. I want to thank my Argentine little brother. Where's Thomas? Get up. Thomas, get up. We need to put our hands together for this guy. Where's Yulisa? Yulisa has the fastest feet. She runs everywhere. Thank you, Yulisa. Katie Brock, all the nice, beautiful people. And definitely we want to thank you for believing in everything that we did. But we also want to let you know next year we will be back here. We will be in Cape Town. We are not backing out. We are not backing in. And Yolisa being an artist, what, what, what you bring me, a rapper? Singer, ain't she? So I thank you, but it looks like Yolisa has a singer for us, so I'll step out of stage because I would have to dance. And I want to thank OPEC for being here. I want to thank Minister Awun from, Mohammed Awun from Libya. He made a decision. He forced it. He made it. He pushed every one of us. He got here. And Minister, we're praying for you. We hope everything goes well, and you come in here. The message we've heard, Libya is back. Libya is in its home with Africa. So take our greetings right back to Libya, to our friends. I want to give in Rene. Rene gave us so much money. And last minute, they demand everything. So if you guys look needing money, go to Rene from our free exam. They have so much money. And he's the only guy who gives you money. He said, I want my logo to be right on top. I don't want anybody. Because he heard somebody else was there. He said, I want to be up. So I want to thank all the sponsors. But also the most important thing, I want to thank you for guys for believing in this. You know, I would close by saying this. I learned one thing being a guy who would protest everybody. Nobody would ever believe that a crazy radical would be up here. Dr. King taught us that the arc of a moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It doesn't bend by itself, guys. It's what every one of us do, day in, day out, that can, we can shape it, we can bend it that way. So whatever we do, starting today, we start that path, that match, towards driving an Africa that we deserve, driving justice every day. So don't wait until next year. Get out there tomorrow. Do business. Shape things. Drive it. And it starts tomorrow. I'm losing my voice, but I can tell you, next week Monday, I'll be in your countries, and I'll be asking to meet with you, and we'll be pushing you. Next year, we're going to bring 10,000 people to Cape Town. It's going to be bigger than ever. It's going to be 10,000. And if anybody thinks we can't do it, you watch us. We will do it. It will be 10,000 people in this city. We are, Africa is going to shock the world. Thank you so much.